Welcome, everybody. Uh, we will wait for everybody to join us. I see we're getting everyone online. And we will get started with some history on Broccoli. We've got some great content coming your way tonight. All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, this I'm Leanne Reed, I'm with ETHS, and tonight we are going to be talking about Broadway history with Bob Dylan and Hugh Rowman, and I'm so excited to hear them from just the little bit that I've heard from when we've practiced. Uh, I think it'll be extremely interesting. They are very excited to take your questions. If you have a question, please put it in the Q&A box down at the bottom. Um, if you have something that a discussion item, maybe uh, raise your hand. We'll try and get to you. We will get to the Q&A box questions. If you're having an issue, if you could put it in the chat box for me and I will try and help you resolve whatever issue you might be having. So without any further ado, I am gonna get out of the way. You won't have to see me and I'm gonna turn it over to Hugh. It's all you, Hugh. Well, good evening. I'm Hugh Reelman, a member of the Brackway Truck Preservation. Mark three on, uh, on the Brackway Company, uh, starting at the very beginning. Uh, William Brockway was a furniture maker and undertaker in the town of Homer here in 1851. Uh, he purchased the Jones Carriage Factory in 1874. And soon after, uh, he was having great success with his carriages. He built a large three-story factory adjacent to the DLNW Railroad. And uh, in the 1880s, it was said that the Brackway factory was the largest independently owned carriage works in the country. They produced 2,500 units per year. William Brockway passed away in 1889, leaving his son George to operate the business. In 1909, George surveyed his wholesale dealers in regard to interest in selling motor trucks. He could see that transportation was uh, changing. Uh, horses and carriages were out and motor trucks were coming in and he wanted to be part of that program. That year, George became an investor and director of the Chase Motor Truck Company in Syracuse. Later that year, Chase began shipping chassis to Cortland to be badged as Brackways and have commercial bodies installed. In 1912, George and his brother-in-law formed Brockway Motor Trucks Company and purchased an empty factory in Cortland. The chief engineer and sales manager at Chase Motor Trucks were hired for those positions with a new company. So he stole away uh, some of the chief people at the Chase Company to come help him establish the Brockway Company. In 1914, Brockway switched from the two-cycle air-cooled engines that they had been using to continental four-cycle water-cooled engines. We have an example of the 1914 trucks uh, on display at our Brockway Museum. The truck is one of six. It was sold to a dealer in Fort Worth, Texas, and is owned and beautifully restored by our current, current BTPA president, Tom Kyle. In 1915, they erected an, another new building for fire apparatus construction. And those chassis were sh shipped to American La France and Elmira for completion. In 1917, they built Class B Liberty trucks for World War I use. In 1918, Brockway was exporting to 65 countries around the world. In 1923, they produced buses, both gas and electric powered. The electric components were supplied by General Electric. In 1927, 
Brockway merged with Indiana Truck Corp to expand their, their market area. But the uh, economic downturn, uh, the Great Depression, uh, Brockway spun off the Indiana operations and reorganized. And uh, as a result of the, the Great Depression, they had to financially reorganize. In 1933, began production of cab forward electric delivery trucks, mostly used in New York City. Again, the components, electric components were provided by GE and Westinghouse. World War II production switched again to strictly military trucks. They produced a B666 prime mover, heavy duty truck, and over 3000 of those trucks were produced. In 1953, George Brockway passed away. He was uh, very active in the community and was well known both in central New York and in his winter home area in Florida as a philanthropist and a community uh, organizer, uh, very active in his communities. All steel cabs were also introduced in 1953. The truck you see behind me here uh, has a wood frame cab. They also introduced the Continental Diesel engine that year, and employees that year also voted to join the UAW. Previously, they had not been unionized. 1954, Brockway was looking for a buyer. White and some other companies uh, were in on discussions. Uh, they had agreements with White and Mac uh, they accepted the MAC offer in September of 1956. Uh, 1957, uh, Brockway did not have a mascot, like MAC had the Bulldog, and uh, MAC management uh, asked Bill Duncan, the PR man for Brockway, to come up with a, a rugged animal who would be the mascot for the Brockways. Bill's son, Jim, who was about 10 years old at the time, was watching Sergeant Preston of the Yukon. And he said, hey, Dad, you should, you should use the husky dog for a mascot. Well, that idea took hold. And uh, the husky uh, was, was made by a, a company near Syracuse and uh, became the, the mascot for the Brockway trucks in Cortland was then known as Husky Town, USA. In 1960, there were four volunteer firemen who on a whim thought it would be great to take their oldest fire truck to Cortland where it was built. And they thought it would be a two or three month journey. It ended up taking them 15 months. It was a 17,000 mile trip. And when they got here, they're treated like real celebrities. They had a parade downtown and uh, Brockway gave them a brand new truck and had it shipped back by boat for, for their fire department. In 1960, the 300 series was introduced and Mac was per purchased by Signal Oil. In 1966, Brockway sales were up by 25% where their parent company only had sales increased by 15%. So they were doing well in 1966. In 1968, Overdrive Magazine named Brockway the most drugged truck in the world in a front page feature article. In 1970, a new plant was, was built and Caterpillar engines were made available. 71 and 72 were banner years for Brockway with over 2,000 units built per year. In 1974, the new 700 series was brought out with Scheller Globe cabs, similar to the R model cab, but not the same cab that Mac used. But it was hard times in 1974. We had a recession, we had an energy crisis, interest rates were sky high and sales plummeted. In 1975, things picked up with a deal to sell 575 trucks to Iran. 
and daily production bumped up to 11 trucks per day. And the company said their goal was to produce 25 trucks per day. But it was tough times uh, for the truck industry. Uh, we had the federal safety standards and anti-lock brakes, which were unproven. And it continued to be a very difficult time for the truck business. And to top it off, uh, there was a wildcat strike in January in 1977. Mac announced that the Cortland plant would be sold or closed. And uh, they could not come to agreement with the union. And so Mac closed the plant on June 8th, 1977, bringing to the end truck production in Cortland. And it was a real hard blow to the community because there were many feeder uh, businesses in Cortland that uh, supplied parts and uh, machine shops did a lot of machine work. So there was a, a, a big blow to the economy in Cortland. So that's kind of a timeline. So I guess uh, at this point, Bob is going to talk to you about uh, production of Brockway trucks. Yeah, right before Bob gets started though, Hugh, I do have a few questions for you. Uh, when was the last year they made the cab overs? Uh, that, would have, that would have been uh, the 1977. All right. Perfect. There were, I know that there were some uh, on the line uh, that, uh, and some of those were cab overs that were shipped down to Elmira to be finished. All right, perfect. And then I have someone who's raised their hand, uh, whoever that was, if you want to unmute, you are can ask your question. Let me see if they do. All right. All right. Well, apparently they're having some technical issues. Bob, if you want to go ahead. Okay. We uh, to get back to the uh, the Brockway cab overs. There were a few on the line uh, when the plant closed uh, December thirty first. Uh, 1976, management people jumped in and finished most of them. The ones that we couldn't were like you said, were sent to Elmira to the factory branch down there. But there was one big order of uh, uh, U-762 TLs to go to, uh, of all places, Saudi Arabia, no, to Iran to work in the sugarcane fields. And it was a penalty order. There was 50 trucks or 51 trucks there. I was in on the engineering of those with the Detroit Diesel 12V71, 475 horsepower Allison automatics. And the cabs uh, were built in Cortland and shipped out. And the rest of the parts were sh shipped down to uh, Florida and, and assembled there and then delivered out of uh, I can't think of the dealer's name, uh, Estrada or something like that. It was the dealer's name. He delivered, they were the last 50 uh, Brockway trucks built. They were, they were all titled as 1977s. Now there were a couple others titled as 77s that were built and not sold. Uh, after I went to work for Mac, it was well into 1978 that I, had a request to certify one of the trucks that remained unsold and was just sold to certify it to pull doubles on the New York Thruway because I was a professional engineer and I had to certify all those trucks. And that was about the last of them though that were ever titled, okay? Bob, this might be a question for you. We have some, uh, Austin's asked, how many people were employed in Cortland in the 60s and 70s? Or maybe Hugh, you know that, before the plant. How many people were employed? Yes. When I was manufacturing manager in 70 and 71, I had 167 union people in the shop reporting to me. And then there were other people in the office and the parts department and everything, I'm going to guess a round number of 400. Well, all right. Do you know where in Florida did they build uh, some of the Brockways down in Florida? 
Where are yes, they? Uh, that was in Miami. Manuel Lasada was his name. He was the Brockway dealer there. And he's the one that got the order for these 50 cane haulers. Awesome. They, they were big trucks. They, uh, they pulled two trailers, 65 foot in length and 12 foot wide and 12 foot high to haul sugar cane off highway from the, from the field to the refineries. All right. Um, did Brockway, Dave was asking, did Brockway use the F model Mac cab for their cab over? We, we used the F model uh, with variations. As soon as it came in, they would uh, undercoat it with Tectel uh, to keep it from rusting because it was notorious for rust. Uh, they'd undercoat them and set them outside. They were so wet with undercoat that they leave them sit outside for a week before they bring them in the building. <laughs> and then uh, we also use some aluminum components on it that Mac didn't use. Uh, but other than that, it was pretty much, yes, it was the Mac cab. One. With our interior trim. We had trim on the doors and headliners and stuff, custom trim, which they didn't have. All right. Well, you take it away and you can talk about your time with Brockway. Okay, the uh, one that uh, I, I went up there in January 1st, 1968, and I remained and uh, I kind of turned the lights out in 1977, I guess, so to speak. The one that they're showing is a, uh, 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 an artist rendering there of a, a 359 uh, TL in downtown Cortland on, uh, on Central Avenue, and that's Church Street in the background. And the one in the background, the yellow one, is a is a 50 inch cab over truck, uh, and there, of course, the husky dog is there. That's right downtown Cortland. Yep. Next slide, please. Okay, this truck is a model. It's it's a one of the last gas powered Rockways. It's probably a, a 257, probably a 260 tandem axle truck with the uh, Continental uh, gasoline engine of about 588 cubic inches or something like that. We were always big in the construction market and the dump truck market and cement mixtures and so forth. Okay. And that was a circa, that one's about a 19, what'd we figure, 70, you something like that? Yeah, early 70s. Yeah, early 70s. This is a shot coming down the line circa about 1972. That's Louis Fitzpatrick leaning on the front uh, wheel and uh, Ed Renshaw doing some hookups there. This is the station where they, where they put the hoods on it and he was getting everything ready to, to set the hood down. Uh, it was a K361 uh, TL. Uh, our, our model designation was quite simple. The first letter designated the engine K, in this case was a 318 Detroit diesel two cycle. Uh, and uh, T just meant it was a tractor and L meant it was a tandem tractor. And it was pretty simple as that. N meant Cummins, which was a big runner. F meant Caterpillar and so on. It was pretty, pretty simple. And we could just look at the model number and pretty much tell what was in it, okay? Next slide. Uh, we're up in used territory there. He's tractors of yesterday at the right next door to the Brockwright Museum. Go ahead, you. Well, if you you got some more you want to talk Can about the, some more. your engineering, why don't you go ahead with that and then we'll come back to this. Do you have some more for me, Leanne? Uh, sure, we can go backwards. You can talk about some of the no, no. ones we've already uh, looked at. Well, we yeah, okay, just leave that shot right there. That happens to be a, a 361 TL. Uh, I think previously I saw a little thing there that might have had a Caterpillar engine in it. Uh, this was our most popular model with the axle back. Uh, oh, probably 80% of the, of the uh, long hood trucks or even more was, was axle back. And uh, this, this was our breadwinner there. That cab was made entirely in the factory. We, we had a stamping for the roof and champion sheet metal 
made the fenders. They made every fender that ever, and they supplied the hoods. We made the doors completely right there and completely assembled the cab. And like you said earlier, it went away in about 1954 or something from the, from the wooden cab to all metal cab. And this would be the all metal. And this cab continued. Well, originally it had a flat windshield and they needed more visibility. They added the little side windows there. So it was really a, a unique, we were probably the only one in the industry that ever have a three piece windshield. And uh, that that's pretty much the story behind. The 300 series was the breadwinner and, and it was replaced with the 700 series. Now, the 400 series was the cab overs and it, met, it went with various engines, Caterpillar, Cummins, Detroit, all the way up to the 12 V71 and to the 1693 cats. And then later on, uh, in the mid 70s, we came out with what they called the 500 series, which we don't have a slide of, which was a low cab forward, primarily targeted to the fuel delivery, home delivery system and the garbage collector. And it was a low entry um, and short cab, no sleeper or anything like that. And we built that right up until the end. In fact, the uh, Cortland Fire Department had one and it's still up there in a the museum somewhere, I think. It was uh, N550, uh, five, uh, five uh, which there was a 527 and then the 550. And, and I think it's still up there. And then of course the 700 series replaced the 300 series model for model. I mean, uh, the, the 760 would have been axle forward Long hood 761 would be axle back. 762 would be extra long hood for 12V71s and uh, and cat 1693s. And then we had the short cabs, the 758 low cab and the 759 high cab when you needed more radiator and a higher engine. That pretty well rounds out the models. Well, uh, Bob, we have a few questions here. Doug wants to know in the chassis number, after the model number, there is a number prior to the sequence number. What did the number in the middle represent? Say that there's I know. After the model <laughs> number. The, the num there is a number prior to the sequence number. So you have the model number. He's asking what is in the middle and then the sequence number. Yeah, it's, Bob, it's like my truck here, uh, 47 is in the middle, and nobody's been able to tell me what that means. It's a 148W-47 dash serial number. And the serial numbers were just, when the order came in, they got a serial number. That doesn't mean that truck ever got built. If the order got canceled, the serial number wasn't used. They just they just kept going sequential. Uh the, the only strange things about those serial numbers was if you were in Pennsylvania and you bought a tractor, say you bought an N361TL, which would have been a Cummins tandem axle tractor, and you could get it TLY. And you could license it as a tractor only, and you could delete the front brakes and license it. And that's where the Y came in. That was the only strange thing I know about modern numbers. All right. Well, I guess it's still a mystery. Um, Mark wants to know what about factory paint schemes? Did they do custom paint? Oh, yeah, they were all custom paint. Hmm? I mean, you you specified the paint you want within reason. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We built some pretty hmm? fancy trucks going right down the line. Oh, wow. All right. And then Ken wants to know who made the cabs for the 527 and the 550? Uh, uh, some outfit in Ohio. Help me, you. I can't think of who it was. Was it the day those uh, cab overs were they made by Scheller Globe? Also? The low cab forwards. Uh, Scheller? It wasn't Scheller Globe. All right. I can't think of it. 
Well, think of uh, it. It'll come to you. And then yeah, I, I can call Wayne Diefenbach in Florida. He'll know. Wayne, you're <laughs> online. All right, we'll get back hey, to you. Bob, Bob Mudge, are you online? Orville Cab, maybe. Oh, yeah, that's it, Orville. Thanks, Doug. Doug Maney for the win. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Doug. Um, all right, Tony wants to know, in the specification sheets, the 400 series had the option of a continental petrol or a gasoline engine. Were any ever built? And if so, do you remember what year the last might have been made? They had it designed in. I really don't think they ever built it. They, the, and the early ones, which are back around 1960 or so, uh, they were strictly Cummins in line, the 855, well, 743s initially, and then the 855s, and uh, the uh, 671 Detroits, and later on the 8P71 Detroits. Uh, I, I doubt that they built a gas shop. I know it was designed in, but I never saw one. All right. Well, if you find one out there, it'll be one to. There's one out there somewhere? I said if there's one out there, I'd be. Uh... Okay. Yeah, that would be a collector's item. So we have another question. I moved over to this slide. Uh, can somebody, can you talk about, can you talk about the Husky Drive? Yeah, um, I talk about uh, the Brockway Truck Show and how that got started. Um, in year 2000, the uh, city of Cortland was celebrating its centennial year, and they were looking for a downtown celebration event, and uh, it was suggested that a Brockway Truck Show uh, bring the Brockway trucks back to Cortland and have a truck show on Main Street. Well, Shirley Randolph was the president of the Downtown Business Association. She had no idea how to establish a truck show, so she went to one, uh, found out some details about a truck show, and uh, we had uh, we had a truck show in Cortland. Uh, about 40 trucks turned out for that first show, and then afterwards there was a discussion of should we have another one? And uh, there was some talk about uh, semi-annual maybe would be okay, but that just about caused a revolt by the uh, Brockway truck owners. They said, absolutely no, there's gonna be an annual show. Uh, these Brockway folks are passionate people and they, they were determined that we would have an annual show. So the show has grown today to a four day event. We start, uh, uh, with 130 to 140 trucks usually. Uh, on Thursday evening now, we have an ice cream cruise to a local ice cream store. Um, on Friday, we do a Husky drive, uh, have lunch at a, at a venue, and followed that evening by an Italian feast at the museum. Uh, and followed by a fundraising auction where we sell Brockway, mostly Brockway parts and uh, collectibles and uh, a fantastic fireworks display that evening. And then on Saturday, we parade from our museum to Main Street. They close Main Street and have an all day truck show on Main Street. That evening, we have a barbecue dinner at the museum and uh, Sunday, we follow it up with a pancake breakfast and an all-brand truck show at the museum. So it's grown into a, a pretty big event. Uh, we were, of course, very disappointed last year when we, we could not have uh, the Brockway truck show. Um, you go back and talk about the Living History Museum? Yeah. Well, after the, after the second show, uh, there was talk about uh, a museum to showcase the living legend of the highway as Brockway was known. And my first recollection of that is my good friend who got me into the Brockway uh, business, uh, collecting Brockways and having a real appreciation for him was John Potter. Uh, John worked at the plant until it closed and then got into trucking and he ran a dozen Peterbilts all over the Eastern United States. Uh, he had restored some uh, Brockways and uh, 
he's the first one I remember saying, we need to have a, a Brockway Museum someday. Well, we formed a Brockway Tr Preservation Association, uh, a not-for-profit corporation. In uh, 06, we found an empty retail facility with four buildings on over five acres. And thanks to a generous gift by Brockway collector Peter Grimm, the property was purchased. Uh, six years of hard work uh, to rehab the buildings began and with over 100 volunteers logging in over 20,000 hours of volunteer work. Uh, the Central New York Living History Center was established to own and operate the facility and a local military collection said to be one of the most comprehensive private collections in the East was looking for a new home. And so we invited them to join us in one wing of the building. And we also asked the local tractor club if they would be interested in setting up a tractor and agricultural display in the barn, which was on the property, uh, which was formerly a John Deere dealership. With uh, good community support for fundraising and several grants, uh, the New York's uh, Central New York Living History Center opened its doors in June 8th of 2012, exactly 35 years after the Brockway truck uh, was officially, plant was officially closed. We will celebrate our 10th anniversary of the center with the grand opening of a new far, historic firehouse building in June of 2022. So we invite everyone to come and, and join us uh, for the 21st annual National Truck Show, August 14th in Cortland, Husky Town, USA. All right, wonderful, you got, yeah. You have a picture there of the yeah. uh, main entrance to the Living History Center. It's a, a beautiful facility that we're really proud of in Cortland. Go, go, go back to that slide of the, of the museum there. One, one more back, okay. In the lower left-hand corner, you mentioned the, about that truck that came up from Argentina. That's the truck right there that they drove from Argentina for 15 months to get here. And wow. they always tried to, to stay overnight at a volunteer fire department somewhere. And there's all kinds, just all kinds of notes scribbled all over that thing about the different places that they stayed. So I just, I just wanted to point that out. And if That's you look amazing. at the scene up above, we talked about the 550 low cab forward. That was that was one of the fire trucks. That wasn't the Cortland fire truck. That's a different. A That's different Daleville, uh, Pennsylvania. Yeah, Pennsylvania. Okay, okay. Yep. Yeah, and the truck behind that looks like the snowplow from the state of New York. It's a yes. 76. A... The yellow one back there. It's a That's 776 correct. with a Cummins engine and the dump body. They used it to plow snow. We built 50 of them and they main used them on the throughway with uh, double double wings and V plows and a pretty rugged looking truck. All right. I do have a few well questions and a few comments here for you. Um, Ken Knapp said he uh, worked in a factory branch in Rochester. And if he needed a complete cab, it was agony to get them, he said. We built, we built service cabs. Yeah. They, they would run them right through the, the, the cab room and run them down the line and, and groom them with all the instruments and everything in them. We built service cabs. All right. Uh, and then see. after after they went out of business, Joe Thomas in Pennsylvania built some service cabs too. I'm pretty sure. Is that right, you? I think he did. I believe he did. Uh, yes, uh, yeah. he did some complete work there for a little bit. Uh huh. Yeah, he tried to build some gliders, but they wouldn't let him <laughs> legally. Uh, back wouldn't let him do that. So. The yellow oh. truck. In the right hand uh, corner there is, was used by Cortland County for about 30 years and it was uh, 
had a bad transmission and hadn't been used for years. Uh, they saw fit to donate that to the Brockway Truck Preservation Association and a group of uh, members of the association uh, restored that about, I guess, five or six years ago. Um, so it's, uh, it's at the museum uh, in very, very nice shape. Wonderful. All right, uh, let's see. Uh, Bill wants to know if, e if either of you remember a fleet of Brockway single tractors used by Grand Union supermarket chain in Albany, or Albany, New York area, middle 1960s, large warehouse in Waterford, New York. I seem to remember seeing upwards of 50 trackers, tractors at the terminal at any one time. Does that ring any bells? Yeah, I have seen pictures of, of their trucks, yes. All right. Well, Bill, good job. Um, and Bill also wants to know, um, oh, that was a single axle tractor for Grain Union is what he was saying. All right. Um, and Tony has a question for you, Bob. What was the 776 model designed for? That was designed for the state of New York because they wanted, they, we had one, cab length it was 90 inch and another cab length which was 117 and they wanted something in between they wanted a little longer hood hood and the main thing was the state of new york specification was on a snow plow it had to be one continuous rail all the way to the front where the plow mounted historically brockway was just bolt an extension onto the frame and, and that didn't meet their specs. So we had to come up with a new frame. And while we were doing it, we just moved the cab back. We could move it to the way the frame drilling was set up for simplicity. We could go back three and a quarter increments. So we went back 13 inches, which made it simple. So now it became a 103 and that's, that's how it came about. Wonderful. All right, Mark Schroyer, you had your hand up. Yeah, I had a question about uh, the uh, Brockway farm tractors and the Brockway trucks. Was there any relationship there between the two, or was that two separate companies, and, and how did they both end up being Brockways? Well, I believe it was the Brockway family in Ohio. Um, they started using the Brockway name, and, and uh, George Brockway said, uh, uh, uh we have that copyrighted, you can't use it. And so they, they went to using the leader name uh, on their tractors. They are still in production, but there were, uh, for a few years, uh, there were Brockway tractors built, no relationship to the truck company, uh, but we do have one uh, at the tractor museum, uh, which is a co good conversation piece. And uh, that does, on loan from Bruce Taylor, who was a Brockway guy from New England. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, and let's see. Uh, Tony asked, "How were there, ah, were many trucks fitted with air starters?" Yes. Yeah, we built some air starters. Mm -hmm. it, it wasn't a real common uh, option, but it was available. All right. And then Mark uh, asked, did Brockway do anything for the 1976 Bicentennial? Did they do a special cab over or Centennial or special edition or anything? For 1976? Yes, sir. Well, that's when the 776 come out and that's why we tagged it 76. And if I might go back, I said, we moved the cab back. I'll take that all back on that 776. They wanted axle back. So we took a 761 and moved the cab forward 13 inches so it became a 104. That way the axle was back the least amount of tear up. All right, and so what year uh, was that fire truck from Argentina? What year is this one, do you know? 1920 something? I believe it's a 27. Like yeah. And I can say that I have driven it around the parking lot, and I certainly want to wouldn't want to head to Argentina with it. <laughs> wow! No kidding. <laughs> wow. Yeah. yeah. All right. 
And let's see, was Clement Brothers their Brockway dealer in Portland, Maine? Do you know? I don't recognize that name. All right. I don't know, Peter. Could have been. Could have been. We had a branch in Boston. I didn't. He could have been a, a sub dealer in Maine that wasn't very active. I don't I don't know. All right. I thought I knew all the dealers, but maybe not. All right. Tony said the Cummins Sunstrand transmissions were available for the 776 models. Were any fitted? We own. Uh, I don't. I don't recall the Sunstrand in the 776. We put it in the 550. Yeah. Very few of them. It didn't work out very well. <laughs> right. Let's see. That was the common substrate. It, it, we didn't do very many. All right. Uh, let's see. Thomas uh, had a statement for us, just letting us know. He started at Pinion Express in 1980. They tested had tested prototypes over the years, and rumors abounded that they retained some. When the Hinsons sold to Conway Eastern Express, they, uh, what became of these units? I started driving Brock's in 1970 at Alex uh, C. Smith Incorporated out of Akron. Most were old Pinion Express units, which shop converted to new Detroit diesel engines and tag axles. Smith was featured in a 12 page article in 1970. Uh, Thomas said he drove many Continental. Pen Yam with a Detroit diesel? I don't think so. He was strictly Cummins. All right. Um, what's the bit of history on the top yellow cab over cab over fire truck? I think they're talking about this one. You, that came from a volunteer fire department in Pennsylvania somewhere. Yes, that's the Daleville, Pennsylvania. That's down the Scranton area. That is one of the few trucks that the museum does own. We don't want to own too many. We change out the display every spring and not having a lot of uh, space to uh, store vehicles that aren't on display. Uh, we really try to not own very many. Uh, I guess we have uh, three or four that the museum does own, but that one there, uh, the Daleville uh, Fire Company, uh, I guess they're actually known as the Covington Fire Company, uh, donated that to the Brackway Truck Preservation. Yeah, Tom said it was the Covington Volunteer Fire Department out of Daleville, yes. Right. And that, uh, Tom, that nice red truck right in the middle, that belongs to Tom Millard. No, no. On down. The red and white one. This one. Yeah. Yeah, that beauty. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's see. Hugh, can you tell us a little more about the Husky Drive and what you do? Well, this year uh, we're going to go for the second time to a, a ski center uh, where we will have some truck games. Uh, they have, we have a, a, a gentleman who, uh, who likes to uh, set up some truck games, uh, uh, driver blindfolded, and he has to go where his co-pilot tells him to go. And uh, we have a contest to see who can back in the best without running over the, uh, the doll and uh, things like that. Just some fun games. We have lunch and uh, a lot of fellowship. And uh, after... After lunch, uh, we leave, come back to the museum. There'll be about uh, 40 or 50 trucks, I expect. They'll go on the Husky Drive. It'll be about a, I guess, a 10 mile drive one way. In past years, uh, we have gone to uh, different locations. We've gone out through the Finger Lakes and stopped at a restaurant and uh, and wound our way back uh, through some real scenic territory. Uh, 
But this year, uh, it was decided to go back to uh, our local ski center, Greek Peak, in the town of Virgil. Well, thanks, you. So I'm going to take that back to Bob, I think, with a kind of a follow-up. So apparently the Husky Drive is maybe named after the Husky Drive powertrain. That's correct. Well, uh, yeah. So can you talk a little bit about that that was available in the 60s? Right. The Husky Drive was an answer to the, the Mac with their Maxidine theory, uh, uh, theory where they had just a five-speed transmission with a high torque rise engine. So we decided to have a competitor for it. Cummins come up with what they called a PT270, power torque 270, which is high rise, which would run with a five-speed transmission. But to make it better, we put a two-speed axle behind it, but you only shifted it once. You would, you would start out in low range on your rear axle, go through the five, and then just shift your axle up to go to to fifth uh, to fifth high, and that way you could cruise down the road just by shifting the axle back and forth. That's all. Yeah, you didn't have to touch the shift lever. And uh, we sold quite a few, and it was it was identified by two huskies on the hood, two gold huskies. All right. Well, we'll come back to that. Uh, Thomas, I, you had your hand up. Thanks for your patience. I, he was going to give us a clarification on what he meant about the, uh, um, the Detroit's, I believe. Thomas? Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir. What, what Alex Smith did is he bought worn out used road tractors to expand his fleet from Penyan Express. His shop converted them to a new Detroit diesel engine and two or three Cummins he did this with probably 30 or 40 trucks, and they stretched the frame, moved the drive axle forward, put a tag axle on, rewired, replumbed, repainted everything, and lettered them. They needed bigger radiators, fuel tanks, battery boxes, which they made, and the exhaust systems in their own shop. And it was so notable, they came out, they were like brand new trucks, and heavy duty trucking, in 1972, did a 12-page article entitled Alex Smith's Homemade Fleet, because hmm. nobody was doing this, but this was after the war, and it, pardon me, it was a way that he could expand his fleet cheaply, and then he started buying new, pardon me, new ones in 1970. Oh. 360 ones. 360 ones with, uh, with uh, Detroit Diesels then, or? I cannot remember. They might have been Cummins. Okay. But in other words, the Detroit powered ones, he built them. He built them in his own shop. Huh. Wow. Probably 671 Detroits? Yeah, 671. Okay. Five and twos they were, the original transmissions and rear ends. But when those trucks came out, they were like brand new. And uh, Penn Yan was pretty proud of him. But did you get my question about the prototypes that Penn Yan supposedly ran? Experimental Rockways. They, they ran one that I remember, they called it the Super 250. Cummins opened it up to 927 cubic inches and uh, they put it in there and it was rated at 250. But uh, if you knew Penn Yan very well, they sometimes, uh, didn't believe those pumps and they kind of tinkered with them themselves. And I'm pretty sure it put out more than 250. Well, somebody, somebody asked about Mr. Henson, whether he knew anything about engines and they said he could tell you what the carburetor jets on those Continentals were, that he knew trucks inside and out. So it's not surprising in the early days if they were playing around, they actually ran triple pumps on the throughway for a while but found out they were too unstable. And they were a pioneer in double bottoms on the on the New York Thruway. He 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 ran, he got certified with a uh, continental gas engine. Uh, I think they opened it up to 602 and kept shaving the heads until they got it up where it would 
it, it would pull pull the devils and make Herkimer Hill 20 mile an hour, which is where he had to certify. And I think it made something like three three runs for the length of the throughway and the engine, uh, as they say <laughs> in the business, through a cast iron shower. So well, you know, you know what Thomas Edison said. You learn more from your mistakes, but he was quite a hot rod guy. And, oh yeah. And just to put that in context, when I pulled doubles for uh, USF Holland in uh, like 2008, Herkimer, I used to roll up there when it was one lane for construction at 17 miles an hour. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we're going backwards. And I had to turn the CB off on those runs. <laughs> All right, thank you, Thomas. Thank you. All right, and Jack, you had a question, go ahead. and. Yes, um, back to the uh, Husky Drive. Somebody once told me, which made no sense, that it was a five-speed with a three-speed rear running through the power divider. Was there any truth to some engineering stuff? No, it, it was even on the tandems. It was a two-speed rear. We <laughs> didn't put the we didn't put the shifting in. You could make a three-speed out of it with a different shifting control. We did not do that. You didn't, okay, because I had heard somebody said they did it, but it wasn't. Well, somebody on the aftermarket could play with that and do it, I'm sure. I mean, the shift motors were there. Okay. The only trouble with those three-speed rears, they were fun to drive with a progressive five-speed. You could you could play a tune with them, but that power divider started giving them trouble after a while. Yes, it put a lot of load on it, I would think. Yep. 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 Sure. Thank you. Thanks, Jack. All right, we have quite a few questions. So I'll try and get to them as we can. We have a few more minutes here left. Uh, let's see, Tony had a couple of questions. One 500 series uh, bogey drive went to New Guinea in the late 70s. Do you know anything about that truck? Yes, we sent one down there that had to take uh, containers or something like that to, to the way far in and, and there weren't any fuel stops or anything because I remember one of the things in the spec was how many miles they had to go on fuel because there was no way to get it when they got to their destination to come back. And we had monster fuel tanks on it to get it in there. I, I, I remember building at least one for New Guinea. Yes. We also built some for the Philippines, which were really interesting because they were 192 inch wheelbase tandems and they had a Detroit 671 in them with just a five speed main and a four speed auxiliary mounted mid shift to use it kind of as a center bearing and they had 65,000 pound rears with a retarder on them hauling mahogany logs and they just needed enough engine to get them back up to the mountain and then they needed all kinds of braking to get them down and they'd, they'd drive them over the river and open the side up and just dump dump the logs off of the side and we shipped oh i don't know we must have shipped a half a dozen of those over there wow all right tony also asked what's the difference uh between a model 527 and a model 550 okay 527 originally came up. The only engines you could get in it were inline Cummins and an inline Detroit. You could not get a turbocharger. So in order to put the turbochargers in it, we widened the cab and made the doghouse bigger so we could get the turbos in it. And then we, uh, the whole cab was really quite a bit different then. So we, we upped it to a 550. Awesome. All right, and uh, you had mentioned the hood emblems uh, earlier. Was the hood was the Husky hood emblem in gold or chrome for any special designation? It went gold on the fiftieth anniversary. You? Yes, I believe sixty-two. Like sixty-two was, was the uh, just gold gold before then. I think it was the fiftieth anniversary they made it gold. That's correct. Okay. Perfect. Um. Okay, so here's, I guess here maybe a little controversial one. Brockway built a super lighter truck that Mac denied existed. Any comments on that? Yeah, if the story's <laughs> true, and I think it is, there was 
guy by the name of Bucky Snell who worked in the cab room there. And he went to work for Mac after Broadway folded and he went to the Hayward Design Center in California, the Mac Center. They, and the story goes, they took one of our 760s, which was the axle forward truck and drove it out there and put it in their design studio. And cause we had all the work done for the Cummins engines, Detroit's and cat engines, Mac had none of that done. And they just pretty much copied it and put a Mac front in on it. That's the story I get. No, we, oh, right. I kind of think it's true. We have pictures that were uh, drawn by the graphics artist at Brockway. Uh, and the one, one of those pictures especially, uh, he, he gave us uh, a lot of the stuff that was in his desk when he left Brockway. One of those pictures looks exactly like a Mac Superliner. It sure does. And yeah. uh, so, uh, and I heard the story that when he presented his plans to the board and there were Mac representatives there that day, that they caught their breath. And when they saw those trucks, and uh, so I, I found a Superliner for a friend of mine uh, out in the Midwest. It's in Alaska now, and I remind him every time I see him, that's not really a 1980 Mac. It's a 1978 Brockway. That's right. Yeah, it was the axle forward. They took one out there, a 760, with the Cummins engine. All right, a little, little intrigue there. Uh, let's see, Tony also asked, were many Cummins Super 250s fitted? One. One. Not very it, it was all painted with stripes on it, experimental. I only ever saw one come through. All right. And then William wanted a follow-up question to the trucks you uh, were talking about with hauling the mahogany loads. Can you explain the retarder you sold, not at all like Jake Brake? The retarders were driven by the rear axle. The, uh, the inner axle differential on those SFDD 65,000 pound bogies was locked in. And on the output of, this, of the rear rear axle, they put this big hydraulic retarder and it was driven. And then of course you had to have a cooling system for it. So the piping ran all the way up to the radiator and so forth to cool it. But it was a hydraulic retarder built by, I'm going to guess Thompson. Strictly a guess. Don't hold me to that one. <laughs> All right. Uh, we won't. Wallace engineered that thing. Awesome. All right. We have two people have their hands up. We'll try and get to you real quick. And that might be about what we have time for. All right. So Thomas, you'll be our first. And then Ralph will get to you. Hello? Yes, Thomas. Okay, I didn't unmute. Uh, I wanted him to briefly address that, I can't pronounce it, the Puerto Rican special, that heavy duty single axle. Okay. And, uh, I believe that was featured in overdrive also. You're right. That was called the Borinquen Queen when Borinquen in Spanish means friend. They were 361s. We used a proprietary axle from Mac. It was called an RAD 704. It only came in one ratio. I think it was 638 or something. And uh, we ran it with the uh, standard 10 speed transmissions and it either Cummins or, or Detroit. And uh, there was a 36,000 pound rear, 22 inch wheels only to get the bigger brakes on it. And they, they were strictly export, no domestics. And uh, they were sold through the dealer in Miami. And we built quite a few of those. It was All a right. popular run. They All right, Ralph, push. if you want to unmute. The fishy back. Ah. All right, Ralph, if you want to unmute and ask your question, and that might be just about it. Um, by the way, Doug Maney said Thompson Retarders is the correct answer. Oh, good. See, you got it right. right. Every now and then, I guess correct. <laughs> you wish you would agree. <laughs> Let's see if we can get Ralph unmuted here. Tony also wanted to know while we're waiting on Ralph, Tony also wanted to know what percentage of Spicer gearboxes were fitted as opposed to Fuller's? Very, very few. 
just toward the end, the SSTs, and uh, they hardly ever got into production. But it was right near the end of the production line up there in 76 when we built a couple splicers, but four was the mainstay, far and away. Gotcha. All right. Now, there was a splicer by speed that we used in, in a garbage truck application, but it was a, a smaller truck. Gotcha. All right. Doesn't look like we're going to get Ralph. Uh, Tom Miller did want to say just thanks, guys, for the recognition of this truck. And thank you, Tom, for that beautiful 361. That's a piece <laughs> of work. It is beautiful. Well, that is about all of the time we have tonight. Uh, I wanted to say thank you to uh, Bob and Hugh. You have so much information in your heads. That's just wonderful. Uh, don't forget to check out if you happen to be in the Cortland, New York area or want to see uh, that area, go in the middle of August and go to the truck show. And we will be back uh, again with more webinars. You guys have asked for them. In fact, um, Bob, you have been requested to maybe speak another time on truck engineering. Okay. So might have to pick your brain on that. That won't um, take long. <laughs> I'm sure it will take a while. All right, and uh, Mark Schroyer, you wanted to say one last thing. Yeah, I just want to thank everybody for participating. There is a there's a great conversation here tonight, and I really enjoyed it. Thank you very much, guys. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, thank you Mark. all. If we didn't get to your question, or you have something you want uh, to ask them, go ahead and email events at ATHS.org. So events with an S at ATHS.org, and we will get those questions uh, to Bob and Hugh to get them answered for you. So thank you everyone for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you, Bob and Hugh. We couldn't say it anymore. Thank you, Leanne. Okay, thank Good night, you, guys. Good, Good night. night. Good night.